Anybody here who has not heard of the Johnson semi-automatic rifle? Anybody? I think everybody has. Okay, well anyway, for those who don't know, it was the nemesis of the M1 Koran. So what I'm going to do in this presentation, I'm going to go through some of the development time frame and some of the political nonsense that actually went along with it. And that's something that a lot of people really don't know about the Johnson Koran. Here's a designer, Melvin Johnson, August 27, 1909, but August 27, that's the same birthday as Paul Mauser. So, just an interesting historical note. <coughs> You'll see him there over on the left, that's where he's at Quantico, the Marine Corps, and the one over on the right is him over in Cranston Arms, shooting his Johnson there. So why did he design it? Well, a little background about Johnson. He loved guns. He was a hunter, big firearm enthusiast. And he really got his taste for firearms when he got sick as a kid and he had to have a tutor. So his one tutor happened to be in the French Foreign Legion, told him all sorts of stories about it, and also he was in World War I, so it really piqued his interest. And eventually went to college, but even though he was commissioned in the Marine Corps, he was actually in the ROTC for the U.S. Army. But again, he got, he got hurt, hurt his back, and he just could not graduate with the ROTC. Eventually, he finally got a commission a little bit later on after, after his graduation. Now, he also felt that the M1 Garand, even though this is in a gas port configuration. Gas system is out, out of date. I was like, well, we had to start the Second World War. He felt that the Lewis gun just shouldn't be gas operated. He also felt that there's a lot of fouling that occurred, and especially with a with a gas trap. Gas port, you still have the the ported hole in the barrel where it's gonna come and push the action back, very similar like a BAR. End block clip. All right, who took my dust? <laughs> okay, uh, it's still there. Okay, good. Hey. <laughs> we want it. We got a nice right. So everybody heard about M1 Thumb. So that's another reason why he really didn't like it. And a few other things I'm going to show you on the Johnson that I really like. So eventually, as an attorney, he got a call from United Automatics. And they were going to come up with this, this rifle system that was developed for the conversion of a bolt action into a semi-auto. So it almost sounded like these guys are trying to reinvent the Peterson gun. So it really speaked his interest. So he got a lot of financial backing, really pushed his company, and it turns out that it was a flop. The guys ended up putting like half the powder charge and, and for it to cycle the action, it just wouldn't work with the regular, regular ammunition. So he was pretty much embarrassed about that one. So his experience in the gas operated, recoil operated, again, Lewis gun, BAR, and 1917. He had a Browning shotgun when he was younger. He used to go hunting with it. He also had the experience with the 1911A1 because, he, again, he was a Marine Corps officer. Model 8 and Model 5. So those type of blowback actions were pretty, pretty, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very influential for him. So the Garand was adopted in 1936. Again, the fouling, damage prone, we felt, and blocks, clip. You ever hear of the seventh round stoppage issue? That's where they ended up, and I can show you on this a little later, if you guys after the presentation. When they decided to mill the receiver, they wore it all the way down. Nobody set the depth stop on the mill. So it went bloop, 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 all the way down and cut through some of the guy brakes. So that caused some problems there. 
you have wood all the way up to the to the front of the rifle, you're going to keep the heat in the barrel. Op rod, they had to make some modifications eventually. So these were some of the things that Johnson saw with the M1 Garand that he didn't really like. So he wasn't really happy about it. So what he came up with is the short recoil system. And this is how the Johnson works. So as soon as you discharge a firearm, the barrel and the bolt, they retract three-eighths of an inch or so. And when that occurs, you still have a lot of momentum left over inertia. And there's camming points up in the receiver and also on the boat. And that's in the bolt. And that's what's going to make the bolt go back. So you, all your energy is going to be lost, especially if you're going to cam a bolt. Now, the M1 Garand, the cam on that rotates a lot more. But here, you figure it has just a few degrees because the bolt is set up like a wire spoke. Very similar to what you would see on any of your AR-15 bolts because the AR-15 has some influential designs of the Johnson. As well. So it's essentially multi plug. And obviously, when the bolt moves back, cams move forward, strips around off, and again, it goes to the battery, and that's how you just cycle the action. And again, just three eighths. That's all it moves back. Eighty-three years later, now you can see my favorite Johnsons. <laughs> That's Alex Johnson, our youngest member of the club. Obviously, to the left is the Johnson semi-automatic rifle with the bayonet lug attached, and the other one you can't really see it. But over there, we go. So you can tell he has a shitty grin on his face. So something like this, I really can't post on the internet. It'll take my Johnson away from me, and hopefully not my other Johnson. <laughs> So, Johnson ended up refining the mechanism on his prototype, patented it, and what he used was an old barrel from the Springfield rifle, and he ended up going to a local machine shop, and they ended up, through some of the rough drawings that he made, because he's not an artist, they ended up producing a, a small little prototype, used the trigger housing, probably from a shotgun, and it was crude, but the mechanism worked. And the interesting thing is, a little while later, got really excited, called a whole bunch of people, hey, you know, I'm going to start to develop this rifle, and so he's looking for investors. So he finally got some money, and got a rifle machine by another machine, you know, I think it was the same machine shop. And he even showed it off to uh, Merritt Edson and Robert uh, Federick, who was from the U.S. Special Service Force. Now, of course, he's in Boston, and he's near Springfield Armory. So he has this opportunity, especially being in the Marine Corps Reserve. He's going to the different ranges. He's actively involved, and he even gets up to see the, the M1 Garand during its development, but he couldn't comment on it because it was still secret. It wasn't adopted at the time. Yet. So he had all these opportunities to, beforehand to realize all their deficiencies. So it's kind of like, oh, okay, I know what's wrong, and I'm going to start to put my own machines in, in motion. So he has this prototype. He wants to show it off to everybody. So he goes down to Fort Benning. So what do they do? They have two guys over there. They don't know what they're doing. They're shooting it, setting it up, and it doesn't fare that well. Well, you got to remember, it's the first prototype, not the, the first thing coming, coming out of the machine shop is going to be perfect. So he claims that the Army sabotaged his magazines. He had failures on it. And 
he figured, you know what, let me go back and I'm going to get another one produced. And he goes over to Marlin. So Marlin actually made the first couple of prototypes. And after Fort Benning, okay, well, Marlin is going to look for some more contracts maybe with the, the Army. So they're real, they don't want to deal with this prototype stuff. So what does he do? He contacts Taft Pierce Company, actually Pierce. Now what they plan on taking this prototype that Marlin made, and they're going to document it on paper. And they're also going to streamline it for manufacturing. <coughs> Goes back again, he has a better magazine where they had some failures, and it's still not favorable. So what happens? Not that happy, and he has a party with some of the officers thereafter. So he's talking to them, they're like, you know what, why don't you get rid of the box magazine? Infantry guys aren't going to be carrying them around on their shoulders and get themselves caught with a magazine in here and dig into them. And I can keep that for the machine guns and everything else. So he's talking to a few of the guys and they're like, you know, think about it. The Grand doesn't have it. They don't have a tackle box. 1903 didn't end 1917. And the Craig is perfect. Why? It has a loading gate on the side. So does the Johnson. And the best thing is, you can have one round in the chamber, and you can keep on thumbing more cartridges in there. Not like the Garand. You have you can't do anything with a with the with the round and battery. You actually can't load it. You're stuck. This you can top it off as much as you want, up to 10 rounds. So that's when he came up with the idea for the rotary magazine. He says, guys, we got to make a rotary magazine. This is what's going to help us. So again, more, more trials. He, got, he has the magazine set up. Now they're going to do some formal trials in Aberdeen. Well, he can't really use the rotary magazine yet. Why? Because it's still not ready. And since you already presented this one over to the guys with Fort Benning, well, guess what? you got to stick with the same one. You want to go through all the grueling detail. <laughs> so he gets some, some more magazines where he had a lot of the failures, and he has the engineers do a better job of it. And guess what? Still comes up with more failures. So instead of getting an F and the Army saying, hey, you know what? No more of this. We're not going to use your... We're not going to even test your Johnson any further. The things jump. So he withdraws it and rather get an I for incomplete, kind of like in school. I'd rather have an I in incomplete than an F for failure. So he takes it out of testing. Well, gun test gives threat to Army rifle. Well, Time Magazine ended up finding a little time to talk to General Wesley, and he said, you know what, we got a serious defect with this barrel, and that is the gas trap barrel. So that is not good news. And they figured you have anywhere from 25 to 40,000 rifles that are already produced that have to be redone. Bad news. That's egg on the Army's face. So you've if you have a lot of people in the ordnance department pushing this rifle, how wonderful it is and how good it is, and then you come up with this big, nasty problem after you produce almost 40,000 of them, that's not looking good. And especially with Johnson trying to sell his rifle to the government, he figures that he may have a good opportunity here. So the press is looking for a good story. So this guy, Lowell Limpet, after he brought, after Johnson brought his rotary magazine down to Quantico, writes up this fantastic article, and of course, what do they want to insert? Controversy. What does our news do today? Controversy. It's not about what's right, what's wrong. It's about selling papers, 
papers and money. So they just keep stirring the pot. Now, yeah, okay, the grand does have a problem, but as soon as that happens, Johnson leaves for England and he's going to try to sell his rifle to the English. And he's really hoping that all of the, the bad press on the grand will say, hey, this is the rifle. So he's hoping for some military contracts. Well, England didn't go for it. They're going to stick with what they have, their, their Enfields. So what does he do? He sees the, the number four Enfield. He sees the bayonet. He's like, wow, you know what? I need a bayonet for my rifle. And being that it is a short recoil system, Obviously, if you guys remember your physics from high school, if you have mass and velocity in one end, you can have mass and velocity in the other. So if you have more mass, you're going to have less velocity here. Okay, you've got to balance out the equation. So he could not fit the standard M1905 bayonet on the Johnson rifle. It just won't work. So he came up with his spike bayonet. Quite often the guys call it a pen spike because that's all it is. Uh, some publications just call it a, a bayonet, others call it a dagger. <clears throat> Small little leather. Not much, just a just a belt loop. This is the only thing that's going to keep it in place right there. Very easy to affix, as you saw with my son Alex. No issues there. The press again. Fred Ness. He's also a friend of Johnson. Brings him up to his cabin, brings up the, the rifles, let them see them shoot and how well it works. And he says, you know what? That thing looks like a pot belly pig. It's fat. Looks like it's pregnant. But I've actually Shot this. I know a few of you guys have during the, the BJ shoots. Yeah. So if you ever, we do have that again, or even in the Marine Corps, you, you want to shoot it? Just let me know. If I got it out there, then you're more than welcome. There's no sense on having a safe queen if you can't share it with your friends. <coughs> yeah. And obviously, that's why we have this club. So he does the comparison between the, the Garand. Doesn't favor the Garand at all. Ah, this Johnson rifle is the cat's meow. So again, there's no big press. You don't have television. All you got is newspapers and publications. That's what people read. That's their information. And of course, scuttlebutt. So having it in a publication, you've got to remember Time Magazine, uh, the NRA, uh, the New York, I think it was the Evening. One of the New York publications that Low Olympic was working for. So that reaches a lot of people. And of course, that's going to go all the way up to Springfield Armory, too, because it's the hub. A lot of bad press. Well, anyway, so now Johnson he brings his rotary mag back because it's the new and improved. So, Army says it still doesn't fare well, it doesn't have the bayonet. You can't use it for bayonet fighting because you would end up holding it up here, right? What are you going to do? You're going to burn your hand? No, that's why they said the, the Johnson was better. Magazine body, they felt it wasn't strong enough. And equal or higher recoil than the M1903. Well, I think that's crap because <laughs> I've even brought up my neighbor. Never shot a Garand, never shot a Johnson. The only thing he'd ever heard of is his father's war stories with, a, with an Emma Carby. So I said to him, which, which one do you like better? Which one's better shooting? He said, I like the Johnson better. Okay, so that's, that's only one opinion out of one person whole. But I just thought it was interesting from somebody who hasn't used a rifle before. Yeah, it weighs a lot. They're complaining about a lot of other things with it. Congressional hearings. 
What are they going to do? Hey, you have this big failure. So Congress gets involved. There's an analysis report that Johnson gives to the congressman to say why his rifle is better. I mean, he sunk a lot of money into this. He has investors. So he really wants to make this happen. And then also, somebody decided to write a bill to say that 1941 Johnson is going to be adopted as another semi-automatic rifle. Well, what about all these guys in the ordinance department? Somebody's heads are going to roll. <laughs> so, just like any other bill, people who don't know anything about firearms are going to write bills to make everything better. But I'm sure the guy was a friend of Johnson and had a lot of other influence with it. So you can actually see over to the left what the top of the bill looked like. And then, of course, you have three congressmen three falling over there. You've got the Johnson rifle here. You see the M1 Garand. And this, believe it or not, this is a Johnson. And under development, he actually had a sword bayonet. But that was pretty much affixed to the bottom end of the receiver, and it just had a slight carriage that it would slide in. So at least this way, he could operate the recoil with it. But I'm sure if that bayonet got bent, it wouldn't cycle. More press. Fred Ness, he, he tests the M1 Garand. Army gives him one. He says, it's overheating, it fouled, and it stopped working. So that was published in the American Rifleman. And again, more bad press. So the Army's pretty much had it. They already got the M1 Grand modifications done, which is your gas port. So you know what? We're going to take the gas port rifle and we're going to have a shoot off, so to speak. And what they're going to do is allow the congressman to come down and actually see them. Because you got to remember, in that photo, all they're doing, they just have it on a table in front. So they want to see it operate, see it work. <clears throat> and Firsthand, they can tell which is better and which is not. The only problem is, Johnson has already had his rifle sent through a lot of the destruction tests, thousands upon thousands of rounds that are fired. His gun's kind of worn out. So he already has something stacked against them. You gotta remember, you don't make too, too many prototypes. So, during this time, Netherlands Purchasing Commission finally gives Johnson an order. The first one was for 10,200 rifles. But, it's chambered in 06. The Dutch is 6.5 millimeter, I believe. So, logistically, how are you going to support this? You've got to get the ammo for somewhere. So, he had a few guys that were over in New York that he also did some contractual work with to sell his guns on the commercial market, the Miranda Brothers. <coughs> they knew people down in Mexico, and Mexico will make you the ammunition. Whew, so now he has, he can sell the guns and the ammunition. But now, he's got a bigger problem because he doesn't have any manufacturing facility. All he had was these great drawings from Taft Hearst and just the, the couple of prototypes that these guys have been working on. That's all. So it's local machine shop stuff. It's not set up. So where does he go? Universal Winding, Cranston, Rhode Island. That's what's actually written on the receiver here. Made in Providence, Rhode Island. And on the side over here, it says Cranston Arms Company. Right on the side, there's a Dutch acceptance mark over on the side. That's the only one that's on the receiver. The other ones are on the barrel, and I'll show you a little later. Right here is the, the Dutch proof mark for the barrel. It's a dagger. 
And right here, I don't know if you can see it, but right underneath my finger there, there's a star. That's what they put on the receiver. All of the Johnsons, with the exception of the prototypes, and maybe a, few, a handful of commercially sold ones, they all have the Dutch food box. Angus, if you want. Here's a spare barrel. You want to take a look at it, pass it on to the next guy. Like I said, it's not much fun if you don't share. So finally, even though the shoot off wasn't very good, and the congressman was like, no, no more, that pretty much stopped that bill from going through. Now, he still has an option with his beloved corps to adopt his rifle. So, so the Marines had their own type of test, but it was accuracy. So it has absolutely nothing to do with the destructive tests that were done at Aberdeen because it was already done. You don't need to do it a second time. So shoot off goes pretty close. Uh, the the Garand obviously was better than the Johnson, but as far as scoring wise, it was like 30 points or so. But you got to remember, the barrel was probably shot out so many thousands of rounds. Everything else was going to be with brand new barrels, most likely. The Army has the Garands. They're going to give them the best Garand. So what does the Marine Corps do? Are they going to adopt the Johnson? No. Are they going to adopt the Garand? No. They're going to stick with their beloved 1903. Okay? But they said, yeah, okay, the M1 is probably would be the one, but you know what? We don't want to deal with this right now. Well, think about it. Marines first to fight. So, you want to go in combat with something that you have barrel problems with? All these fundamental issues? They back one. Well. Go with what works. So, Marines, you have 23 Garand rifles, uh, excuse me, 23 Johnson rifles. That's for selected snipers. And this is pretty much a gift that Johnson ended up. It was pretty much a loan, but it turned out to be a gift. So he gave them 23 rifles for them to go try out. The rest of the guys were armed with Johnson light machine guns and also the, the rising model 55 paratroopers with the folding stock. So here they have all of these newer weapons. But it's interesting to note that even though the Marines wanted more of the machine guns, well, he had to develop this all through the same time that was going on with the Johnson. And the good thing about it was it still worked off the same mechanism. So here he has the option of having his, his firearms in combat for the first time. So Sergeant Tully ended up taking out a Japan. Japanese soldier, 800 yards out. Over 42 of them were killed with the Johnson rifle that he had. And as you can tell up here, Look Magazine, it was another popular magazine back then. And they featured him with that, but he had a Garand. <laughs> so obviously, the, the press showed the wrong rifle. This is the only time that has been officially documented in the table of organizations and equipment for the Marine Corps. They actually had over 200 of them transferred over to the uh, parachute regiment. And they ended up fighting over in the Pacific as well, but this was not on Guadalcanal, but it was still within the Solomon Island chain. But eventually, 700 and 50 of them were transferred over to the Marines. Some of the Marine Corps modifications that were done, 
They cut down the protective years, very similar to the 1903. They're below 1903. You don't have the peat site. They scratch the bee in there. More like a leaf. Not like your 1903, but as close as they can to file out the field. So no more peat site. Now, not all of them did this. Chile gets cold. They ordered a thousand. Well, Chile chambers their rifle in seven millimeter Mauser. Uh, luckily for Johnson, that it's the same head on the cartridge for the seven millimeter as it is for the 06. So. Again, the Miranda brothers, hey, you know all those contacts in Mexico? Can you get me some barrels? Sure. So he got barrels from the Mexican government. And you can actually see the Mexican ordinance stamps are right at the bottom by the column. So if you would pass that around, you can see them right here. One of the nice things about the rifles that came back from Chile, this is actually one of them. They're the most complete. I must have searched for, I don't know how many years for the right one. And I felt this was the best one that I came across. The stock is not sanded down, and you can see the contours here, right on the, right by the tank. The wood almost goes all the way up. Quite often you see this sanded down. The wood is nicely oiled finish. The best thing is parkerization on it is, I, I think, at least 90%. Considering it's 83 years old, that was the best I was going to go. So I was pretty fortunate. There are some blogs on the internet that some guy can end up by serial number of your rifle. Look at the build logs because this is the only thing that survived from, from Johnson was the, the Chilean contract. And it's probably because it was the first series of rifles that, that he ended up producing. This is the instruction manual. It's a reproduction. Photos are extremely poor because it's a reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction. But something is better than nothing. However, it is extremely informal, but it gives you plenty of information, especially how it works with the cans and a nice breakdown. Now, not like Stan where he went to each and every single Army Depot around the United States, I happen to come across the military handbook for the Johnson. This is an original one. It cost me eight bucks. And I know I broke, broke the bank on that one, but uh, couldn't believe it. The, the pictures are absolutely gorgeous. That's why I keep it under plastic because paper doesn't last long. So to preserve history, I gotta keep it out of as many hands as possible. No offense, gentlemen, but I gotta preserve the history. It has everything from the vertical feed magazines, which were the not the full BAR mags, but they were like five and eight round magazines, vertical feed compared to the rotary R. That's actually in there. You won't find it in the military manual because they didn't sell any of those to, uh, to military. And believe it or not, they even have one written in Spanish for, uh, for Chile. Some of the other things I end up collecting. Johnson Automatics, military ammunition chart. 
everything from the Second World War. So they were involved just as from a company standpoint. Johnson not only did the machine guns, he was looking into mortars, even 20 millimeter uh, Vulcan cannons and stuff like that. So he had his hands in a lot of different cookie jars. Springfield Armory, they even experimented with a rotary magazine in the Garand. So, two top ones are M1 Garand rifles with rotary magazines from the Johnson, and the bottom, obviously, is the Johnson. Post war, what they do afterwards. Johnson Automatics, he got a lot of the surplus back from, from the Marine Corps. I sold them like for 250 bucks, cost them 50 bucks to get them back. Winfield Arms in the 50s. They imported a lot of them. And they were either sporterized, <clears throat> sometimes they were even produced with a 270 barrel. You can use it for hunting. You can still use the 06 for hunting, but they put a nice front sight on it, cut the barrel back a little bit. Navy Arms. They imported mine from Chile. The nice thing is, Joe Scott, actually produced this barrel. Everybody who's ever looked at it thought it was original. Why? Because I made it look original. We parkerized it. It looks gorgeous. I just put the wear on the finish to make it look the part for the rifle. And this is the, this is the barrel that I use when I shoot it. Because you guys who probably have the barrel around there somewhere, it's frosty. If I'm going to go for a score, <laughs> I'll use a better barrel. <clears throat> Something that Johnson didn't have. Now, Joe Scott, apparently, he made this on the Johnson machinery. Whether or not that's true or not, but that's what he told me. One of the nice things about the Johnson is with a five round stripper clip. And our acting sergeant of arms checked us out. These are dummies. Put it right in the side. You can load it. You can load your jobs. Or if you want, you load them individually. And the best thing about it is, it's not like it's a double stack magazine. We have one coming from the left side and one from the right side. One from the left, one from the right. They all come up straight because it's, it's single feet in the rotary. So, and if you want them to come out, just press, press the gate. They all come out. Load it, unload it. And you can still have a, a round in the chamber and do that. Very multifunctional in that respect. So I really like the way that Johnson designed this guy. I really do. Not because it's my same last name, but. <laughs> I just think it's fantastic. You know, just the just the intuitiveness to come up with it. That was great. And again, short recoil. So for that, gentlemen, I thank you. If you have any questions, can, uh, did the Marines get that so they could jump with it as it came apart? Uh, oh yes, thank you. Yeah, let me show you that. Right on the side, there's a button that you can use for the ammunition. Poke that in there. Flips, that flips this little lever down. Pull it out. Barrel comes right out. Now, this is one of the things that the Parachute regiment really liked about it because you don't have to stay in the day. You're going to go out of an airplane. Right. I remember, what's his name? Another Johnson from my club. He was in the 517, Alan Johnson. He told me that in his, in his bag, 
it strapped across his chest on the side so he jumped out in France. But his was an M1, of course. So to put this in a bag, you don't have this long thing sticking out. The other good thing about the <coughs> Garand is it's in three, three pieces compared to two, but if you just happen to lose this part, you're SOL. Well. That would trigger out. So, yeah. Now, of course, you can put the barrel back. Everybody loves it when your Johnson's nice and tight. Back <laughs> it. Yeah, a lot of the Johnsons that I saw no. had a deep blue fit. Were they be blue by Winfield Arms? Or yes, they were, they were definitely deep blue. Now, Johnson even has in some of his catalogs that I've seen mm -hmm. that he'll refurbish them, put a nice, scorerized blue finish to it. Thank you. But they left the factory parkerized. Left the factory, yes, all parkerized. This has more of a dark, dark gray. You can see over on the on the rotary magazine, it has that greenish, like some of the Garands do. <coughs> but yeah, they were all parkerized. Yes. So I also understand that the largest supplier of used parts for the Johnson is the Cuban government because they supplied the Bay of Bates? Uh, it, it could be. I do not know that. I, I did hear some interesting things before. Maybe, maybe it was yourself at one time, but I, I did hear that. Now, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, Sam. One of the things that Springfield Armory ended up having in its records was oh, around 700 Use serviceable Johnson rifles, and then like around 500 that were not serviceable. Well, if only 750 came to the Marine Corps, everything is later for the Dutch, where, they, where the other ones come from. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that Johnson ended up selling them to the United States government for uh, the, the Free French, I believe it was for. So they were slated most likely for the resistance. So where are they going to get them arms? Especially if you're going to have to drop them out of a the plane, parachute. You know, they just saw it as another way of bringing arms to them. So for all you know, some of those may have been destroyed. Some of them may have been sent to the Cubans. I don't, I don't know. But it's, an, it's a pretty interesting part of history. Thank you. Uh, Stan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brigade 2506 Bay of Pigs had M1s and M1 carbines and Brownies, but I know in the, in the 60s, if I went to a gun store, you could buy a Johnson for the same price as an M1 Grand Rewell. They were, at that time, there was enough of them out there. Yeah. And what they did is the CIA bought a lot of Johnsons because they were 30 odd six, and they were giving them to some of the Cuban rebel groups in, you know, that were already in Cuba. But Brigade 2506 was M1s. They were, they were fully equipped, you know. Okay. So the, the guns ended up in Cuba, yes. Okay, that's great. Now, one of the interesting things that I found out is that there were three ammunition plants that actually made 30 out 6 ammo, and they, actually, they had special head stamps on them. It made it look like it was a foreign supplier. I think it was AN40, BN40, CN40. And this was top secret because they would use them to supply other countries with ammunition, either the Rams or probably the Johnson. I wouldn't be surprised. I actually found a few of those rounds over in Pennsylvania for sale. So I got them up and they're in my ammunition collection. Yes, sir. Uh, 
And I believe that uh, they were uh, going to send uh, quite a few of them to the Dutch colonies uh, in the Japanese. Yep. They Absolutely. never got there, unfortunately, in time. Correct. That's, that's my understanding as well. Yeah, even though the Dutch bought them, Japanese invaded South Pacific, not sending them there. So that's why Johnson had all these rifles and couldn't do anything. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and consider becoming a Patreon member for the ASP. Please check out the ASP Patreon page.